Hi and welcome uh, to another lecture. Uh, today I'll be covering, uh, on this beautiful sunny day, I'll be covering uh, a streetcar named Desire scenes one through six. So we're essentially doing a, a kind of as much of a split uh, as we can do with this play. Um, I've been working on this module quite a bit uh, over the last few days. Uh, so have a good understanding of uh, kind of the work that you're doing, the discussion questions, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, posts, uh, that you are putting together so I'm kind of lockstep uh, with everything that's happening uh, for this play. Um, I've put together as you can see here um, some some pretty uh, extensive notes uh, kind of gone back through my own annotations. Uh, I have a little bit different version of the book that I've been working uh, on that I've worked on in the past um, but what I've done is in my notes that I've put together here I've made sure that I'm referencing the pages from the, the book that you have uh, so it should be uh, pretty clear. Um, so I'll be covering uh, again scenes one through six here. Why don't we get started uh, right away just so we're not taking up uh, too much time. So we start with scene one. Um, I did a little bit of a, a background information on Elys the Elysian Fields which is the name of the neighborhood in New Orleans. Uh, I think it's a it's a true to life uh, neighborhood in New Orleans. Uh, it seems to have a pretty ho uh, a pretty heavy uh, Polish um, uh, immigration. Uh, in in this neighborhood uh, but we also get some interesting uh, snippets of uh, African-American uh, culture a lot of the blues that's playing that's always seems to be kind of playing in the background obviously as of an African-American background uh, when we talk about the blues and even that color blue um, which is uh, essentially a motif throughout this play we're talking about suffering all right so it's usually a, 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 a example or, or a motif of suffering and through that suffering uh, we can gain hope and inspiration um, ironically, uh, of course. Um, now, if you look up Elysian Fields, if you actually do the, uh, the illusion work on this, uh, what you find uh, is that we're, we're going into kind of Greek mythology. Uh, so in Greek mythology, Elysian Fields is the paradise to which heroes, uh, who the, uh, is, is the paradise to which heroes move on to that the gods have conferred, conferred immortality. Uh, so if the gods think that a, a human being is deemed for immortality uh, and are heroic in that sense, uh, then they uh, uh, off they go to the Elysian fields. Um, it does say here, kind of interestingly enough, um, that there's kind of a, a three-step process for, for Blanche as she arrives uh, at Stella's home. Um, it's first you get on a streetcar named Desire, so we have this idea of Desire. Um, and then uh, it says you transfer to one called cemeteries. So then there's the idea of death. So you start with desire, uh, then you uh, then you you pass through death, and then you finally arrive at Elysian uh, Elysian Fields, which uh, again I just says is uh, where the gods uh, deem. Uh, those heroes for immortality. So essentially you start with desire, then you move on to death, and then lastly there's this uh, idea of immortality. Now I think it, it's an interesting way of thinking about Blanche and it's an interesting way of thinking about Stanley, perhaps the two characters that oppose each other the most within this text. And I, I encourage you to maybe think about uh, the development of these characters or at least as we get closer to the end, uh, kind of the, the final outcome of these characters uh, in regards to desire, death, and immortality. Is that kind of what they're both in search of? Okay, very good. Uh, so again, uh, it's a good way of thinking about the characters. Uh, desire, death. Of uh, what, what kind of death are we talking about? Are we talking about a literal death? Well, maybe. Uh, not necessarily as far as the main characters were involved with, but we do get the uh, mention of death when it comes to Alan, uh, the the young man that she uh, 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 fell in love with early in her life. I'm talking about Blanche here. So there is the death of the estate, uh, Bella Reeve. So there is some death. But maybe we're talking about a death of pride. Uh, maybe we're talking about a death of ambitions. Maybe we're talking about a, a death of, of, of fantasy uh, and idealism. Um, so it, it could be a number of things. 
And when we talk about immortality, you know, I don't want to say too much in totality. Uh, you're viewing this lecture uh, after reading and doing work on, on scenes one through six, so I don't want to say too much uh, about uh, the rest of the book beyond that. So some of the stuff I'll just gloss over, uh, or I won't say it at all, actually. Uh, okay. Um, I think there's a fair amount of religious illusion and, and obviously some religious kind of themes that, that play into uh, this text, even though we're starting on some Greek mythology, uh, which just could be happenstance. Um, but the address of their home, I believe, uh, is, is 632. Whenever I get an address and I have a feeling, uh, or a number of any kind in a text, and I have a feeling that it is endowed with a kind of religious meaning, one of the things I'll do is try to find uh, meaningful biblical verses uh, and passages that correspond uh, to that number. Um, and there is one that I found here for 632 uh, that might be fairly relevant. Uh, it says, if you love those that love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners lo love those that love them. So I can't get credit simply for loving people that love me back. Because even sinners do that. So I guess what that's saying, what it's, what it's not saying but implying is you should love those who don't love you. Um, I guess that's one of the radical things about Christianity, or, or at least the figure of Christ, was he, he came out and said, love your enemy, right? Which is a pretty, uh, must have been a pretty radical and revolutionary thing to say back in the day, uh, because most people would oppose their enemies, but to, to even love your enemy. So I'm not sure if that necessarily uh, is, is helpful for us or, or not. Uh, I just found myself looking up some of this information. Um, okay, so Blanche, we understand, uh, and we get this laid out in chapter, uh, scene one. Blanche heralds from a prominent wealthy background, uh, but there has been a death, and now she has arrived at Elysian Fields, and of course that death is the family fortune, which she'll open up quite honestly and directly, uh, and explain a lot about how that fortune came to an end, how the family estate uh, of Bellarive, uh, which translates to beautiful dream, so how the beautiful dream essentially came to an end. We'll get more about that. Now, uh, uh, the symbolism for names, I think, in this text can be very helpful. I've mentioned this in the past in previous lectures. Stella translates to star. And even Blanche says it's Stella for star, right? So when we think about a star in the sky or stars in general, it's essentially something fixed. It's, it's reliable. And maybe Stella is, is supposed to be a, a, a very reliable character for both Blanche and Stanley, yet they're both contending over her in some kinds of ways. We also know Blanche is a school teacher, and uh, she's an English uh, teacher, uh, which is interesting because here we are reading literature. Uh, there'll be, uh, when we talk about Alan, the, the young man she fell in love with, he was a poet of sorts, uh, and she, she loved him for his poetry as well. Uh, okay. When, we, when Blanche first arrives at their apartment, Stella is definitely a bit embarrassed for her accommodations. Uh, and she knows that the kind of lifestyle and the kind of uh, accommodations that she has does not live up to the same grandiose uh, environment that she grew up with, with Blanche's sisters, of course, uh, at Bella Reeve. So there is a little bit of embarrassment. She's a little bit anxious uh, as, as Blanche comes into the home. And we also understand that she's equally as embarrassed uh, about Stanley uh, and uh, the friends that Stanley has as well, especially as they gear up for their wonderful, wonderful poker nights uh, that they uh, tended to, to put together quite often. Okay, so definitely a level of embarrassment uh, for Stella. You know, really quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I think a major theme of this text, and we're gonna be doing a lot of thematic work uh, throughout the semester. I mean, it's kind of like this step-by-step -step process that we have here. We gotta figure out them uh, themes, more importantly, thematic statements, and develop those and nurture those, getting ready for the papers. So I think classism, right? Uh, the distinctions and the opposition and the resentment between classes, uh, upper class, middle class, uh, uh, lower class. Um, I think those definitely are at play within this text where you have uh, Blanche 
uh, coming from an upper class background, even though that's essentially disintegrated and kind of you know vanished um, and, and kind of broken away versus Stanley who really kind of comes from obscurity and he, the only reason he kind of gained any kind of I guess you could say you know uh, uh, prominence or at least kind of became something uh, is the time that he spent in the military right and we, we get some reference to how he looked in a suit uh, uh, things of that nature one thing we notice uh, right away uh, is that there's really no privacy uh, in this apartment uh, I think there's two rooms uh, maybe maybe it may be a common room beyond that but the rooms are, are merely separated by uh, just like sheets and things like that I don't even think there's doors so you're constantly hearing other people in the apartment and you really aren't secluded uh, if you wanted that seclusion and I think uh, you know f uh, if we do some analysis on Blanche she wants that privacy and it goes beyond just physical privacy right like give me my space and leave me alone uh, for Blanche and I don't think this is speaking too much uh, ahead of where we're, you know where we currently are which is the very beginning but for Blanche she wants another level of privacy which is don't know my business right stay out of my life I don't want you to know about the uh, darker aspects of my life, right? The, the things I don't want people to know about, keep, let me keep those to myself as well. So I think there's an immense sense of privacy that she's looking for, uh, especially as people come to prod and poke and find out more about her through kind of word of mouth and uh, what they're hearing, especially Stanley. Stanley's on the, you know, he's on the prowl looking for information uh, to essentially diminish the stature and the character of Blanche. Stella <clears throat> warns Blanche to don't make any comparisons to Stanley. And I think that you can look at that in a couple different ways. Um, one is that he just, you know, don't compare anybody to Stanley because she knows there's a bit of an embarrassment here. He doesn't match up. He's vulgar. He's base. He, uh, you know, um, uh, he lacks uh, a kind of reputation, uh, so don't don't try to match him up in any kind of way because he just doesn't compare to you know he won't compare to anybody. Uh, he's got he's too much of a civilian, right? He's got this civilian background. Um, on the other hand, a way of interpreting this to say don't don't go comparing anybody to, to Stanley is he's incomparable. You can't he's he's a whole different species. Uh, he's on a whole other level compared to some men. Um, this is true in some regards. He's strikingly handsome, uh, I believe. He's got this kind of powerful presence uh, that can't be denied, especially compared to other characters, say Mitch, uh, and definitely say Alan, who's probably the biggest contrast to uh, Stanley is going to be that Alan character who's not in the play, but only through kind of recollection, recollection and reminiscing do we find out a little bit about Alan. But he's a major contrast um, to Stanley. So maybe he's in, don't compare him because it's just, uh, he, he's, he's in a league all of his own, right? And there's, there's nobody that really compares to him. Blanche. I stayed and I struggled. This is where she kind of criticizes Stella a little bit, but I think based on us as readers, we're free to criticize whoever, whoever we want based on our own perspectives here. But Blanche criticizes Stella, it seems, uh, because Stella just left the estate. She, she left, she kind of focused on her own life. Uh, she began uh, her own relationship with Stanley and kind of just went in her own direction. Whereas Blanche was essentially chained or tied to that estate and had to be there for the, it seems, uh, you know, frequent uh, deaths uh, of family members. Um, you know, she, she, she has a beautiful thing. I mean, this is a beautiful play. Some of this, the, the language and the ideas that are presented, beautiful. She reminds us that there's a difference between a funeral, which is all kind of presented very nicely and it's after all the difficult times are over and here we're finally putting to the person to rest. The funerals are what Stella would attend, right? Stella would come back for the funerals. It was Blanche that was there before those funerals, the weeks, the months, the years leading up to those funerals. She saw the death. She saw the decay. She saw the, the, uh, the deterioration uh, of uh, the Bella Riva state and the people that uh, uh, were a part of it. 
not just there for the kind of, you know, the more presentable uh, and, and benign funerals that were, uh, that were staged. Uh, so I think that was a very good point that she makes. So I, this was one of the questions I think you, you, you answered in some of the discussion questions. How virtuous is this decision for Blanche th that she took the burden of trying to uphold a family reputation, keep it together financially, while Stella only cared to look out for herself? What are the pros and cons of Blanche's decision to stay at that estate and, and deal with the, with, with, with the things as they were occurring, right? Versus what are the pros and cons of Stella charting her own course and essentially kind of leaving all of that behind in exchange for finding her own life and, 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 and populating that life with people of her own uh, choosing. So I think that's a great question and I look forward to seeing what your responses are there. I said it before, this is why we gotta, you know, just do the basic translations people because it, it, it gives you a whole nother level of meaning. So to know that Bella Reeve is beautiful dream, on one hand it's a, it's a fairly nice name for an estate, on another it, it reminds us of what we're talking about here with Blanche. She was trying to hold on to and keep together uh, a beautiful dream that she had and it was a very difficult thing for her to do, in fact impossible, because we know that that beautiful dream essentially crumbles, the estate crumbles. So essentially we are given the figurative meaning of what Blanche took, uh, took upon herself to keep together, to uphold it, because, uh, to, uh, be, but to uphold it, uh, it could be she is not accepting reality. So if she's trying to hold on to Bella Reeve and keep it afloat, keep it pasted and taped together. Maybe she's just not accepting reality, which is that this estate and this dream is fading away. Maybe it's a bit desperate. She desperately tries to keep it alive. This could add to her neuroses, uh, her kind of mental issues, her mental complications. Okay, so that could be what leads to some of the issues that uh, she will eventually be faced with here, okay? So on page 21 and 22, this is I just mentioned this, so I'll, I'll just breeze through it. Funerals are pretty compared to death. Just beautiful. Great reminder. Uh, uh, don't let me go. Hold me. This is what the people of the Bella Riva State, uh, the, her family members, would say to her as they were dying. Right. Of course, it's kind of generally uh, 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 applied here, but that's the kind of pressure and the burden that Blanche was dealing with. Right all these people desperately trying to hold on to her as if she was the only kind of possible surviving remnant of this estate, you could imagine the overbearing and, and, and uh, 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 emotionally difficult um, uh, effects this would have uh, on Blanche. And I, I do think this is rightfully overbearing because she, she's really presenting this uh, to Stella as it was tough for her to deal with. Uh, and it is a great cause of sympathy uh, for Blanche. Alongside this, she accuses Stella of being oblivious to the issue uh, with the uh, Bella Viva state uh, as she moved on to Stanley. And she does use the word Polak. Uh, and we should know, I know, because I come from a, uh, a Polish uh, background. I have a big mutt, big mix, but I have some Polish blood. A Polak, I, I believe, is an insulting, demeaning, uh, almost discriminatory term for Polish people. Poles, P-O-L-E-S, is absolutely fine. And Stanley will even kind of stand up for himself uh, later on in the text. Uh, but here she calls him a Polak, uh, and that is a very insulting term for a Polish uh, individual or a Polish-American individual. So Stanley, on page 24, we, we get some kind of early uh, introdu we get some early descriptions of him. He's given this characteristic of animal joy, uh, and it says very clearly his pleasure is women, and he is in possession of a power and pride like that of a richly feathered male bird among hens. So that's the abrupt description and characterization, mind you, that we get of Stanley. He's like this, this, this powerful and prideful uh, person, just like a richly feathered male bird. I guess, you know, you think about some of those birds that kind of flaunt their wings uh, to be the center of attention, and that's where they get their power and pride from.
Now, it's an interesting metaphor because you might ask you, you might start to do some some kind of comparable or comparative, I should say, uh, analysis, right? Which is if the bird puffs up its feathers and does these things and that's where it gets its power and pride as it attracts these male uh, these female birds what's stanley's way of puffing up his feathers um how does he um uh, achieve the kind of power and pride that he has especially as far as an appeal to other women is concerned where does it come from is it the poker uh is it his violence uh is it his uh, you know, once in a while, how sleek he can look when he puts on his little silk, uh, you know, pajamas or, or a really nice bowling shirt. Where does that power and pride come from, especially as an appeal to the opposite sex? Um, so this was something that you did a post on uh, or will be uh, that you have done a post on. Uh, all this are all surrounding this sense of masculine life, right? It's an interesting question. How much of everything that I can say about my identity and about my life <clears throat> stems from or revolves around my stature amongst women? Um, if I could say, I, I know you're talking a lot about this in the discussion post, which is a very, very nice, but I, I, I mentioned briefly, you know, I know growing up as a man, as a, as a male, um, high school, college, that's all guys talked about was you know, it, who, what girls they were getting with and what they were doing with these, uh, with these girls. And it really became a competition of sorts. And I think a lot of men, uh, young men, do derive a sense of value and worth from their success or failures with the opposite sex. Um, and how much does that define everything else about your life? It's such an interesting and deep question. And uh, I look forward to seeing your responses uh, when the time comes. All right, Stanley's motto, this is on page 26, just be comfortable, right? Uh, we know he comes from a kind of common uh, background, right? Uh, he's kind of just, you know, your average kind of guy, even though he does have some incredibly violent tendencies, which is not to uh, be seen as average, not, not even close. Uh, but he's kind of like your average Joe, and the most important thing is just being comfortable which entails, <clears throat> for him at least, crudeness, vulgarity, indecency, etc. All potential virtues of the common class, which of course is at odds with the manners as expressed and represented by Blanche of the upper class, right? Uh, and, the, uh, and, and the upper class's pervading sense of themselves. So that's where more of this classism kind of comes into play. Uh, which is distinctions and even kind of resentment, resentment between classes. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and for Stanley, the most important thing is to just be comfortable. But I think if we're being critical of that, what comes with that comfort, right? Are we to accept all of Stanley just because of his motto here of just be comfortable? On page 28, <clears throat> Stanley even, I think Stanley has some insecurity, especially with Blanche in the home. And he does say, and I think he's a little worried about this, I'm afraid I'll strike you as being the unrefined type. So he knows that he is, as they say, rough around the edges, unrefined. And he's admitting to it. He is honest about it. But this serves as a defense mechanism because there is evidence he is ashamed of his unrefined characteristics. Lastly, there is another death that we are uh, uh, that is revealed, that we are made aware of by the end of this scene. And this, of course, is the boy she was married to when she was very young. And this, of course, is Alan. And we'll talk more about him uh, as these scenes progress. Scene two. Right off the bat, page 29. Stanley accepts a kiss from Stella with lordly composure. And the word, the diction, which is one of those big devices that we have to pay attention to all the time, lordly. So I think there are some evidences, uh, especially when we see language like this, that we are talking about God or gods and goddesses or even Christ to some degree uh, or, or anything that deals with this kind of high and mighty stature, right? And he accepts Stella's kiss with lordly composure. Page 30. We're given an example of juxtaposition. The device of juxtaposition, 
uh, is when we have an immediate kind of compare or contrast, when two things are immediately situated side by side within what we're reading so that we can easily compare and contrast uh, these two things. And what's juxtaposed here is the death of the Bel Bellariva state and also the birth of uh, the upcoming birth, the uh, impending birth uh, uh, of Stanley and Stella's son, right? So there we have a death, a clear death, and now we have a clear uh, birth as well. And of course, you know, I'm not going to go into great detail what's the analysis there. Well, how do we analyze this juxtaposition? What I can do oftentimes in these lectures is just present things to you that maybe you did see, maybe you weren't kind of noticing, but I can present that to you. So as you gear up for papers and more analysis, you're made aware of these things. All right. Blanche's weakness is flattery of her physical appearance. And this might be, you know, a flaw of sorts. Uh, she is majorly uh, invested in her physical appearance here. Maybe even more than her psychological well-being or her spiritual well-being or, or something else. But her weakness is flattery of her physical appearance. Moving on, Stanley mentions the Napoleonic Code, which ultimately means that a man is entitled to money from the role, uh, uh, from, from what his wife is in possession of. And since Stella has some stake in the Bella Riva state, Stanley's like first thought is, well, what does this mean for me? It's, it's a pretty selfish, I think it's almost inarguable, uh, but it's a pretty selfish uh, motive uh, coming from Stanley. And he bases it upon this idea of Napoleonic code, right? This is just the way that it goes. What's, what's, my, what's, the, what's the wife's is also the husband's, right? Quite early on in scene two, page 34, you know, actually closer to the middle, you have Blanche adorning herself in jewelry and her wardrobe and it almost makes her seem like a goddess of some kind right and we go back to that greek mythology that we start off with a little bit uh and this really makes stanley angry right you can tell that this makes him very angry moving on to page 35 he actually uh, i think she puts on a tiara of some kind uh, and she caught and i think it's fake i think if you get later on into the text we realize some of this stuff is all just kind of fake whatever but he calls it a crown for an empress now empress is interesting uh to throw in a theme here uh that might find that might be relevant is idolatry which is when you worship anything else than kind of the christian god right uh or or any god kind of that that comes from that christian tradition right um the one true god right so if i idolatry if you've read romeo and juliet and you're teacher or professor was not talking about the sin of idolatry, they weren't really talking about some of the most important aspects of that play, um, which is to say, idolatry means I worship myself more than God. I worship my physical appearance more than God. Uh, I worship kings and queens uh, and presidents and, and all of these people with, with, with major authority in our lives more than God. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, you worship youth uh, or youth and beauty more than God. And these are all punishable uh, in, in, in various ways. So I think that this idea of idolatry does kind of plug in here. And maybe we can say that Blanche is, is guilty uh, of idolatry in the sense that she worships her physical appearance. She worships wealth. She worships what wealth can get you uh, more than God, right? Or at least something more psychological and spiritual within her. Will she change? Only time will tell. Page 38, Stanley states his policy on compliments. I think this is one of your questions, or maybe not. I, I'm not sure if I put this in there. He says, you just don't give them to a woman. That a woman doesn't need compliments. If she needs compliments, something's wrong with her. All right? Which means, by default, that Stella is the type of person who, who um, does not need compliments to survive because of Stanley saying that he doesn't give compliments and we know that he's married to Stella and the relationship is it's, it's happening it's it's ongoing then she's not the kind of person who needs compliments right now is that a virtuous thing or are we critical of Stanley as far as this mantra that he has about not giving compliments I look forward to seeing what you have to say about that um 
this is one of the questions. I must have asked this because it's an interesting question. I wanted you to relate this idea to your own life. How much of your own self-worth or self-value is contingent or based upon others' praise or compliments of you? And if you realize that it is, like what your parents say about you, what your kids say about you, what your teachers and professors say about you, what your wife or husband, companion uh, says about you, uh, what people on Facebook say about right, the, the, it goes on and on. If you do realize that it's based on other people's praise and compliments, the next question is, well, is that a problem? Or is it not a problem? And again, these are all interesting questions and I, would, uh, I look forward to seeing what you have to say about them. All right, so um, I'm not sure how much evidence there is. I'll be quick with this. Sometimes Stanley, for me, and maybe this is just my own sense of history or, or kind of what I've been exposed to, but he comes across at times, especially in a scene later on, which I won't say much about, as a very kind of powerful god of some kind. And he is threatened by Blanche. And one maybe theme or kind of just a historical uh, kind of context that we can kind of overlay uh, over this, uh, this, this very nice play is we have to remember that, and I might have mentioned this in a previous lecture, about 2,000 years before the advent of Christianity and Christ uh, and all of that, you know, faith, um, it was paganism in the world. And that was the major spirituality of the times. Uh, and women had prominent roles within pagan uh, religious systems. They were essentially the priests, the priestesses. They were called wise women. Uh, they're the ones who really did all of the major ceremonies. Uh, and they performed all kinds of positive roles uh, within their societies. And of course then, 2,000 years before the advent of Christ, you have the Indo-Europeans come and they bring a new type of god, male, aggressive, uh, warrior sky gods. And you can see it in Zeus. Uh, you can probably see it in other gods uh, that were <clears throat> of some popularity during that time. And then they start to, these male warrior sky gods, start to demote the female deities, the earth goddesses, the goddesses of fertility. You've probably seen some sculptures of these. If not, Google it. You'll see what we're talking about. That goes way back into the past, right? I think you can look at Stanley, the contention between Stanley and Blanche as the, uh, the kind of broader conflict between women, the power of women in this world, and the power of men, right? Um, it's undeniable, uh, and if you have different ideas, please let me know, but it's pretty undeniable that in most of the world today, it's patriarchy. I think we're lucky to live in America because the patriarchy is not necessarily as strong, though even that is arguable, uh, than in other parts of the world. But basically men uh, have dominant roles within society uh, and we're finding that this is changing uh, in some ways, but uh, uh, there's resistance in others. So maybe that's what we're dealing with here, uh, is the, the conflict of the power and influence of men versus women in general, right? On page 42, Blanche is going through some, some old love letters, old love letters uh, from Alan, and she's taking these out. Maybe she's encouraging herself, making her feel better about her situation. We know that she's got a lot that she's keeping to herself, uh, and it will kind of gradually be exposed, right, gradually. Um, but she says to Stanley, the touch of your fingers insults them. One of your questions was, why? One response I can give, uh, and, and I'll just leave it at one to kind of speed things along here is, because Alan was so, so different, right, represented a complete different sensibility of man, sensitive, caring. Uh, he was gay, or at least he experimented with another man, right, versus this incredibly violent and aggressive and explosive Stanley. Uh, uh, it's, they're just so different that I don't want those hands of Stanley defiling what this individual Alan was all about. I'm sure you have other uh, um, ideas as well, and I look forward to reading them in your uh, responses. Also on page 42, Blanche does admit to taking advantage uh, of Alan, uh, this young boy writing her these poetry and these love letters. 
she admits to taking advantage of, of him and as he was young and vulnerable and maybe this is a, a source of her guilt sorry about the air conditioning hopefully my voice is not being drowned out by the air conditioning but we will see um, so this is something that maybe she and Stanley actually do have in common that they're taking advantage of other people or at least Blanche has taken advantage of other people in the past is she taking advantage of Mitch uh, and is Stanley taking advantage of Stella uh, these are in, uh, uh, some questions we could ask on page 44 um, we we get more truthful information about what happened to Bella Reeve and Blanche says it it was the men notice she says it was the men why the men because the men were probably in control of the estate ultimately right they're the ones who made these decisions even if they were bad decisions uh, there was nobody that could really stand in their way so it, it is very clearly men men exchange the land for their fornications Fornications, uh, the literal meaning of fornications is to have sex, go out and kind of willy-nilly, casually have sex, fornicate, right? Um, not worrying about uh, what the consequences of those actions are going to be. Um, it, it probably is sex, right? That's part of some of the fornications we have here. It also could be other things that would lead to the complete loss of or demise of a family estate. Some of those, some of those things being drinking and alcohol, uh, some of those things being gambling, uh, maybe some of those things being just really bad decisions made on behalf of the estate, uh, not even thinking about the estate, but thinking about your own kind of personal well-being or your own personal interests above uh, the estate. It's a complete lack of prudence. This reminds me of like The Sound and the Fury uh, by William Faulkner. So the, the themes as far as a southern, a prestigious and wealthy southern family losing it all based on really bad decisions uh, that men, Faulkner, women as well, have made uh, is, is strikingly similar here. Okay. Here's a question. Is Blanche just an extension of that tragic flaw of these endless forni uh, forni uh, forn uh, fornications that have led to the loss uh, of the Bella Reeve or this beautiful dream, right? Is Blanche just as guilty? Does she harbor characteristics and express characteristics throughout this play that shows that she is just as much a part of the problem that has lost that estate? Here's a question. I think, you know, I don't know, when we talk about protagonists and antagonists, you know, my gut, my instinct is Blanche is your, is your protagonist, because I do feel she gets, she's just, there's so much tragedy surrounding her that there's so much sympathy, right? And Stanley, for me, comes across as the ultimate antagonist. But I think they're way more complicated and complex than that, which is a, a testament uh, to Tennessee Williams and the characters that he gives us. But here's a question. If I think of Stanley in a different way, he's crass, he's rude, he's common, he's a he's civilian in so many different ways. Is this what Blanche needs? Does Blanche need a guy like this to kind of rip her off of her high horse so that she can start living in the reality that confronts her, right? Or is he more of a problem uh, to uh, her needs uh, or her development uh, and, and, he's in, and we're to be critical of him? Or is this what Blanche is in need of? And I think that question, the answers to that question can definitely go in, you know, in different ways. At the end of one of your questions here, I look forward to seeing your responses. Is the blind leading the blind? How is Stella blind? Because she's leading Blanche. In what ways can we say that Stella is figuratively blind here? In what ways is Blanche figuratively blind as well? Moving on. Scene three. I got a lot of I got a lot of notes for scene three, so I'll try to go through these pretty quick. Okay, uh, we are uh, introduced to Mitch. Look up the translation of Mitch. Oh, Stanley, the translation on Stanley is a stone clearing. Not sure exactly what to make of that. I know if I'm thinking about a stone clearing, maybe that's the beginnings of a town, or in other words, a civilization, and Stanley represents kind of society and civilization uh, in all of its kind of complexities uh, and its erroneous thinking. Maybe that's it. Here's Mitch. 
Mitch is very similar to Michael. So when we think about Mitch and Michael, it's a translation. Uh, connects to Saint Michael. And the rhetorical question that we need to be aware of here is, who is greater than God? It's a rhetorical question. And a rhetorical question means, I don't, I don't care about what your answer is. I'm, I'm presenting you the answer within the question. So if I say, who is greater than God? Then the answer is, nobody. Ain't nobody greater than God. And I think that's a dead giveaway. Mitch is your highly religiously infused and saturated character of this text. And you can see this through his interactions with Blanche, who is in need of some kind of psychological cure or spiritual cure in her life. Um, it also translates quite simply to a gift from God. So Mitch is that gift from God. I'm just going to go through my notes. I could kind of wax poetic uh, on, on all the different ways uh, that Mitch uh, could be that gift uh, from God uh, that Blanche might be in need of. But he's got his... He's got issues, too. On page 46, here we go with poker. I used to play a lot of Texas Hold'em on uh, PokerStars.net. Never for money, but I would sit there and play a lot. I just don't have time for it these days, but it is fun. But let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a somewhat competitive affair. If you're playing poker, you're in it for the competition. Let's, let's, let's not beat around the bush here. Also, I guess it's more of a question, is this an expression of masculinity? I think for these men, it is. What are y'all guys going to do tonight? We're going to play poker, right? Because that's what men do. And Stanley, of course, is leading the charge. He is, by far, the most, uh, uh, the most um, uh, uh, excited. Uh, he is, by far, the most um, invested uh, of the bunch when it comes to these poker affairs. And he, he does everything he can to kind of filter out the noise of the women or to keep the men kind of tuned into the game, especially Mitch, uh, so that nothing gets in the way of this poker, uh, playing this poker game, right? To be contrasted, Stanley, to be contrasted with Mitch, who is essentially an outsider in this regard, as he is tied to uh, his sick, grand, uh, sick mother, uh, who is not doing so well. Also, he's not married. Uh, so there's a little bit of a contrast here. Uh, we'll definitely see on a, at least a few occasions where Mitch is, I don't want to play. Uh, no, nah, I'm out of this hand. I'm out of this hand. And Stanley kind of chastises him uh, and admonishes him for not playing. Okay? Page 49. One of the guys shares a joke. And it's about... It's about... A hen... I mean, I, I could read the joke, but I, I don't really need to. It basically relates the idea that a man will choose his stomach or some necessary obligation, something essential to your being, existence, over sexual prowess. So it reminds me of the joke. I think there's like a, 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 a male uh, hen uh, or whatever, they, a rooster, uh, and he's always chasing after this one hen who's always running away from it. Uh, and then the farmer kind of puts out some food in front of that, that male rooster, and the rooster stops for the food, and, and the hen kind of goes, you know, is allowed to get away, and he's not paying attention to it anymore. Um, not sure exactly how to analyze all that stuff, but I guess it brings up this idea of kind of necessity and obligation, right? A man will choose his stomach over kind of chasing a woman. Page 52. Blanche comments that Mitch is superior to the others. And this is one of your questions. Why does would she say that? Why would she say that he is superior to the other men? Right? I think on a sinister level, uh, she might realize right away that he is vulnerable uh, due to his sensitivity, uh, that maybe she can take advantage uh, of him uh, more easily uh, than the other uh, men. Reminds her maybe of the boy that she had a, a love affair with, uh, married, I believe. I think it says she was married quite young. Alan, who of course has the very tragic death. He also treats her, this might be one of her main reasons, he also treats her like she is still in possession of her old life and her kind of grand stature and wealth. 
uh, unlike Stanley, uh, who treats her uh, like he would treat anybody, right? Uh, and kind of bringing her down to his level. So Mitch still gives her uh, that revered, uh, still gives her that, that reverence, right? As, as she is still a woman of, of dignity uh, and uh, some kind of uh, notable background. This is my son, Jacob. And I just wanted to show everybody this little guy right here. I don't think he's going to help out uh, with any of these lecture notes today, are you? Probably not. He looks awfully serious. Why don't we make you look a little smarter and put a pen in your hand. There you go. And you're going to eat it. That's always going to happen here. He's uh, 14 months and he's a complete joy and uh, I really feel incredibly fortunate to have this little guy in my life. Yeah. You want to say anything? You going to be quiet? You want to say some stuff to the camera? To all the students out there, you want to say anything? It's getting warm out here, isn't it? There's a, a small debate uh, over uh, Stanley's kind of general promise, uh, just how much potential he has and whether or not he's kind of destined uh, for greatness. Uh, and obviously Stella, uh, maybe, maybe even by need uh, and necessity says, yeah, of course he has promise, right? Um, he's he's going to do great things. He's, got, he's the kind of person, he's got the kind of drive where he's going to accomplish uh, great things in life. And of course Blanche uh, dismisses the idea and is highly uh, suspicious of it, right? Um, one thing we learn on page 55 is that Mitch, uh, Mitch is not wild. Uh, in the sense that he, he just keeps out of this, this gambling stuff. He refrains from it altogether. And you always have Stanley trying to press him to get involved, right? Uh, and it really infuriates Stanley uh, the more and more Mitch is distracted from the poker. Uh, and he's always trying to pull him back in. Also on page 55, Blanche is just not afraid of Stanley. Uh, he contends with him, uh, opposes him. Here, chew on this side. I want you getting the ink. Can you do this side? Oh my gosh. This side. There you go. Uh, sorry about that. Um, Blanche is not afraid of Stanley. Uh, we realize uh, quite, uh, quite clearly in, chap in scene two, uh, there's a, conten a contention between them. She opposes him. Um, and... Mitch's reluctance to engage in the poker game uh, starts to coincide with his interest in Blanche. She becomes his priority over uh, being involved in this poker game. Another thing that also coincides with his kind of uh, disconnection uh, from the poker game is his need to get back to his mother uh, and take care of his, uh, his uh, sick mother at home as well. On page 58, uh, we start to find some common ground. Some common ground uh, for uh, Blanche and Mitch uh, that they both have lost young lovers. Uh, and that's a pretty uh, unique thing to have in common here. Uh, there's a reference to a Browning poem. If God choose, I will love you better uh, after death. And I think the... Our goal as readers is to uh, apply, uh, our role as readers is to apply uh, that statement to the characters and the events uh, of this text. In what ways can we apply this idea that I will love you better after death, right? How do we apply that statement? Um, this was one of your questions to do a, a pretty stark contrast uh, between Stanley and Mitch, uh, what seem to be the major differences uh, that they have as far as their characters uh, are concerned. One thing we do notice, oh, and this is, this is huge, on page 63 it happens. Um, it, 
Stanley gets so upset uh, by the women kind of interfering in the poker game, Mitch not getting involved, uh, amongst other things, and he actually strikes Stella. Uh, and this is where we realize that he has a propensity uh, for uh, physical abuse. Uh, and the men, including Mitch, probably Mitch most of all, uh, at least when it's happening, are feeble in their attempts to stop him. In fact, the word feeble is even used, or feebly uh, is used, which means that they really can't stand up uh, and put uh, Stanley in his place, even after he has, he has taken this action against his wife. Uh, they are essentially helpless, and maybe even hopeless, uh, against him. To be technical, Mitch does get up and starts to help out a little bit. On page 63, Mitch says, poker shouldn't be played in a house of women. I think this was one of your questions. Why shouldn't poker be played in a house of women? Maybe it has something to do with the competitive nature of poker. Maybe it has something to do with the aspect of gambling that it entails, uh, that it shouldn't be played in a house of women. Obviously, by saying that poker should not be uh, played in a house of women, he has a particular idea of what poker, uh, of, of not only what poker is, but who women are, and whether or not they should be, uh, how they should be protected as well. That he he has a particular impression of women in the sense that they need to be protected uh, from this kind of an activity and what it represents. The men immediately pardon Stanley for what he's done, uh, which is interesting. We live in such a highly politically correct world these days where if somebody were to do this at a party, well, I would imagine, right? Somebody were to do this at a party, there'd be all kinds of uh, uh, repercussions and consequences, uh, but here, uh, they just basically pardon him and, and move on. Then, of course, comes the iconic, especially when you talk about, here's the cover of my book, uh, Marlon Brando, uh, I believe, is the one who plays uh, Stanley uh, in the very popular kind of theatrical version uh, of the play. And this is where he's screaming at the top of his lungs, Stella, 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 come back to me, Stella. My question is, are we at all sympathetic towards Stanley in this moment? in what seems like his incredible agony. He does act humbly toward uh, Eunice, uh, as that's, where Stella, that's who Stella is with. But this is contradicted by his yell that occurs as a heaven-splitting violence. Um, the stage direction uh, in Tennessee Williams' play here at times leans on, uh, or, or uh, um, verges on, the poetic, right? He screams with a heaven-splitting uh, kind of violence. And there we get into this whole idea of heaven and the divine, right? On uh, gods and all of these things, right? On page 67, they come together, Stella and Stanley, in low animal moans. They are only human beings. Um, I, really quickly, I can just get this out there very quickly. When you think about uh, who we are as human beings in the religious sense, without religion we're animals, right? And that's essentially what we are presented with here. There is no civility without religion. We are essentially beasts, right? That's why we go back to 666, Mark of the Beast. Uh, man was created on the sixth day, etc. There's a lot of biblical stuff taking place here. Um, so they come together with these low animal moans. They are only human, they are only beasts, right? Maybe lacking uh, the civility of religion. Um, one way of looking at this, she must nurture her own child, her child-to-be, and also the anger and repose of Stanley. Ch Stanley is her child as well. She is the ultimate virtue of womanliness, motherliness, uh, but this could be to her fault as her eyes go blind with tenderness. It's not a good thing in literature to go blind in a figurative sense, and here they go blind with tenderness. Uh, and she catches his head and raises him level with her. They, ex they exit. The singular Blanche fills that void. So where they were standing together, the singular Blanche comes into uh, that space. They cannot operate in the same space. They represent two very, very different sets of ideas. They cannot operate in the same space there. Page 68. Mitch, Mitch expects Stella to return to Stanley. It's the norm. He is used to it. This could be an aspect of their class, commonhood, which is this notion of violence, domestic abuse, and the acceptance that comes with it, right? Is this a part of their class? 
Mitch accepts it. Maybe we can be critical of Mitch for accepting this kind of uh, abuse and accepting the idea that Stella basically kind of forgives Stanley in, in a pretty, pretty short amount of time as well. In the end of the scene, yes, there is a, a kind of confusion in the world. It's a certainty. And so is Mitch's powerlessness and diffidence against it. It's a, and it could be a reminder of the theme, I'll love you better after death, after I've taken so much chance and opportunity and then regret it all, all right? Scene four. I'll go pretty quick. In the beginning, we have uh, more confusion. One of the questions is, what is there to be confused about? That was one of the questions that you dealt with uh, in your responses. Blanche's uh, appearance to Stella is complete is a complete contrast. Stella is quite kind of uh, put together, uh, even ironically, despite what's happened to her, uh, where Blanche is kind of a, a, a described as, um, you know, out of sorts uh, and just kind of a mess, right? On page 70, Stella does not need Blanche's concern. Obviously, Blanche wants to uh, uh, kind of flood her uh, with, con with her concern, right? Are you okay? Are you okay? I can't believe what happened. How dare he? She doesn't want it. She is used to her life, but perhaps confused as to why she accepts this as her life. May for her, on page 72, she just chalks it up to uh, drinking uh, and playing poker, right? On page 72, Stella talks of marriage, which... Their wedding night was a, a dashing and violent affair. That could be the union of man and fate, who knows? Um, this is where some interesting symbolism kind of comes into play. It's mentioned that he smashed all of the light bulbs with the heel of her slipper. What a thing to do on your wedding night, right? Uh, to smash all the lights in the house with the heel of her slipper. And I asked you to kind of look into uh, the symbolism of this. Uh, and I think one way of looking into it uh, is um, he takes this kind of symbol of womanhood, uh, this, this, this heel, right, that a woman commonly wears, and he smashes out all the lights. Now, her name is Stella, which is essentially light. So he's kind of taking some aspect of her womanhood and smashing out uh, maybe her potential, uh, the promise that she has, right? Uh, so back to what I was mentioning briefly, it's, it's almost like he's smashing out the potential with this kind of symbol of her womanhood, right? And on a very literal level, just what a guy uh, to do that on your wedding night, right? Um, I don't know if there was drinking involved or this is just kind of the anger uh, that kind of expresses itself or it's his way of having, having a good time. But even on a literal level, it's quite an awful thing. Uh, uh, I, th I think Stanley uses some refined accessory of Stella to extinguish the light of her, to put out the light of her as star, uh, to keep her down uh, and under uh, his control. With careful analysis, Blanche may have been guilty of giving in to this controlled role of woman as well. She adores her feminine beauty, but in that she is kept at the heel uh, of men, which ties into some ideas that I've gotten from Thornstein Veblen's um, theory of the leisure class. He talks about women uh, and how really, uh, you know, the dresses and the heels, it's all a way of keeping them dependent on men. But that's a whole nother idea. Page 74. Uh, Stella says, you just got to tolerate other people's uh, habits, uh, I guess. And uh, one of the questions you had is, do you agree or disagree with her, especially when those habits uh, are uh, domestic abuse uh, and physical violence and excessive drinking, etc. Are those the kinds of habits we need to tolerate? And is this a, 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 a byproduct, this idea that I'm just going to, uh, you just have to tolerate what they throw at you? Is that a byproduct of domestification, right? Um, that's another question. I would argue that both women are under the heel of men. Uh, Blanche just comes from a wealthy world. Stella from the bottom, uh, or at least kind of currently residing uh, in this kind of common class. On page 78, Blanche uses uh, her eyebrow pencil. Uh, which is a uh, maybe potentially a symbol of domestification uh, as a tool for liberation and uh, independence where she's writing down information about somebody who might be able to give them money to start their own shop and kind of fend for themselves. On page 79, Glenn says, only way to deal with Stanley's animal nature is to appease it sexually, to encounter it on a sexual 
our most instinctual habit, perhaps, that kind of a level, right? That's the only way you can deal with somebody like Stanley is on a sexual level. And Stella, on page 81, verifies that. And she says that sex can make up for all kinds of unfair, unfair, unrealized, and barbaric treatment in a relationship. So you can treat me horribly, there can be so many unfair or unjust things occurring, but as long as the sex is good, uh, uh, or there's something about that sex uh, that is, you know, noti uh, that is notable, it can s essentially kind of make up for all of the other horrible treatment. That's at least what she says. Uh, and we can have our own opinions. On page 81, there is a reference to the devil. Of course, it's kind of uh, uh, colloquial and offhanded, uh, but at the same time, it's followed up by, not too uh, far, uh, not too uh, much after that, uh, the word bestial. Uh, so when we talk about the devil, we are talking about uh, you know the mark of the beast here. Uh, so it seems like some of those themes are kind of coming out. Uh, which does, uh, which... which explains the recurrent reference to people as animals because we are without God or Christ, our religious doctrine, uh, or an adhesion to it, etc. We are essentially animals, right? So it's because of that lack of religion or that lack of spirituality, the lack of God, right? And therefore, we can maybe argue that there is no humanity in Stanley, according to Blanche. She really lets it out. Uh, she calls it his poker night, right? He's in total control of this. And she calls it a party of apes. Again, animals based on instinct and sex and lust and desire. And no way to essentially manage uh, or to keep those desires at bay, right? That's what we're talking about here, right? Therefore, we are a long way of being made in God's image. It does seem like there's adequate evidence for this claim as presented by Stanley, especially the desperate need for forgiveness, just like a hopeless sinner when he was begging and begging for Stella to return to him. Okay, just a little bit more here. Scene 5. It starts with an argument over cheating between Eunice and Steve. I think Eunice and Steve, and you can look up the meaning of their individual names, um, but I think Eunice and C Steve essentially serve as this kind of relationship that Stella and Stanley learn from. Uh, they live above them. Uh, they're constantly listening to them to fighting. They hear them fighting and, and arguing about all kinds of things. And Stella and Stanley seem to just kind of laugh it off. And, and again, like Mitch said, it seems to be the norm. But should we accept this as the norm or should we be critical of it and try to uh, uh, have a different uh, understanding of what a relationship really should be and a broader understanding uh, of, of the relationship uh, between men and women in general, right? Uh, her voice is a terrible wrath, which is, whenever I hear wrath, I'm, I'm thinking of a godlike description. On page 86, the same violence occurs in this relationship as well, which may serve to normalize the behavior. Eunice numbs the experience with alcohol. It seems that she has reversed the violence on Steve, right? So she actually is the one who hits him. When the scene unravels, when it happens, it, we're pretty... It almost feels like the violence is occurring to her, but then Steve comes down and he has bruises. So he definitely got some of it. That's, that's made clear. Uh, violence is an attribute for men and women, therefore. Page 88. We discovered that Stanley is born just five minutes after Christmas, which of course is the birth of Christ. Uh, Stanley is the goat. Uh, not a positive biblical designation, right? Uh, Capricorn, goat. The goats are not given necessarily a positive uh, biblical designation as they are seen the ones as the ones, the parable of the goat and the sheep. The goats were, not, were the ones who were inhospitable to Christ's needs. Blanche is the virgin. She's a Virgo. And that's quite a positive, uh, quite a positive uh, designation. Page 90, Steve and Eunice display the norm. Furious, earth-shattering fighting, followed by a deep, apologetic, and melodious love. Almost like what we saw with Stanley and... Uh, Stella earlier. Did they learn this from Steve and Eunice? My question is, is this normal or is this a sign of a dysfunctional relationship? And that's a question um, I didn't ask in a discussion questions because you didn't have them for these scenes, but I would love to hear some opinions at some point in time. Um, Laurel 
and the Hotel Flamingo. Blanche has a very checkered past, and we're starting to find out about it. A very floozy and promiscuous past. Page 91. Um, Blanche says you have to be soft and attractive, and this is kind of brings us to the paper lanterns. Uh, it even it even really serves as a reference to her name, uh, Blanche, a softening of light. Right, uh, page ninety four. Uh, she gets some coke. It spills on her white dress, uh, and maybe the white dress is a metaphor for Blanche's. Uh, um, uh, the coke is a metaphor for Blanche's indecencies, uh, and of course, it's tainting uh, or soiling that white dress, which could be purity and innocence. And it foams over. Uh, and if something foams over, that is a good metaphor for indulgence and desire. When desire foams up, uh, kind of foams over and spills out the cup, that means that we have given in to these indulgences, right? And she blots it gently, which is to essentially gently deal with the corruption here, right? Gently in itself, just the diction of gently, is a motif that occurs throughout this text over and over, maybe even the most out of any other motif. This idea that there needs to be a gentleness, right? That people have to do things gently. It doesn't stain uh, the coke on the, on the dress. It is not a permanent part of Blanche and she feels lucky and is grateful. Notice what I did there is I took something very literal, the spilling of the coke on the dress, and I essentially picked it apart for figurative meaning, right, piece by piece. Uh, and that's extended metaphor, uh, when it's not just one thing that we're analyzing, one piece of a metaphor we're analyzing, but many different parts. Okay, page 94, Mitch is coming at uh, 7. 7 is interesting. We talked about 6 being the day that uh, men and women are created in the biblical narrative, uh, and therefore imperfection comes with men and women. Uh, day 7 is a day of rest after the imperfections of man, an affirmation of the power of God will arrive. And he's coming at seven. This is completely verified on page 95. She says, I want to rest. I want Mitch, right? Um, and then she can leave uh, this apartment, which is essentially the corrupted world. Uh, I think the, the microcosm of the apartment is the macrocosm of the world in general, right? And there's, as we get closer and closer to the end, there's this idea that she just wants to leave. Blanche just wants to leave, not just this apartment, but this world. And maybe she's preparing for it. Maybe not. Page 96, Steve is likened to a goat in his giddy perversions, as he's kind of chasing after Eunice. Stella and Stanley follow, uh, imitate their uh, intimations. That's the end of the scene. Um, Blanche desires fiercely the flame and promise of youth. This takes us to the young man. Uh, who seems very vulnerable in this scene. This is the man who, uh, the young man who's uh, selling uh, the evening star, star Stella. You can make some connections there. Then comes Mitch. She instincts him uh, to bow to her, which is strange, right? Bow to me. It's almost like a reversion here, like she's going back to some former uh, kind of understanding of herself here, right? And we can do a little bit of compare and contrast uh, with Mitch uh, and the young man as both do seem vulnerable and willing to please. Uh, and the young man I meant is Alan, right? Not necessarily the uh, guy who's uh, selling the paper here, right? All right, last scene here that we'll cover in this lecture. Page 100, Mitch feels compelled to uh, win uh, through violence and gambling, an ideal, an idle statuette of sexuality. So they go out on a date and he wants to win. Notice that he gives in to this competitive drive to win Stella uh, Blanche's uh, um, approval, right? And he does it through a game that not only is there shooting involved, right? It's like a little game you'd see at like a carnival or a fair. So not only is there shooting involved, which is violence, but there's also this idea of chance. I might get it, I might not, which is gambling, right? And Andy's trying to win a, an idol idolatry, right? A statuette of Mae West. And if you look up Mae West, she was a sex symbol uh, of the uh, time period, right? That is such a great metaphor for all the issues here. And what it seems like is Mitch is almost crossing over. If Mitch is this kind of godly and pious individual who is devoted to his mother, he's being taken away from all of that right now as he is shooting and gambling and trying to win a statuette of Mae West, which is essentially a symbol for idolatry and worshiping sex and lust and desire more than uh, the one true God. It's a beautiful little part on page 100. 
As a consequence, they are lifeless and uneasy right, of what they're doing. Blanche basically asks if desire still grinds along this time of night. She's talking about the train. Therefore, meaning lust is a dutiful obsession uh, for her. And here we have prudence, which is the owl, versus this whole notion of desire, right? Because he says that no, only the owl travels at this time of night. Blanche has corrupted Mitch, so it seems. Mitch cannot keep attention of Blanche. Even though he's kind of trying to win her approval and doing these things which seem very un Mitch like out of his character, she's still not really, he's not winning over Blanche here. Page 102. We're given some more Greek stuff here, Greek mythology stuff. Pleiades, Seven Sisters. Um, and I'll read here. So when we talk about uh, Pleiades or the Seven Sisters here, it's the seven daughters of the Titan Atlas. Uh, the, and the Oceanid Plyon. I'm not probably pronouncing these correctly, I apologize. The spelling will be here. They were pursued by the hunter Orion until Zeus kind of got angry and frustrated and, uh, with Orion and changed the seven sisters into a cluster of stars, essentially making them off limits to block Orion's desire, right? So basically this, this illusion and, the, and the, the information behind it uh, kind of represents the idea of preventing desire. And it could be kind of getting at this idea that Stella is the sisters and Stanley is Orion and Hunter. But also I think we could probably make even clearer connections when we talk about Blanche because the idea of desire very much connects to her character. Um, you know, this, this could lead, I, I talked about this in one of the, uh, I will talk about this in one of the Capote short stories that you'll be reading, but really quickly I'll lay out the Hellenic versus the Hebraic. The Hellenic is, derives from Greek culture, which is almost like a worship of like the human body and the human achievements, whereas the Hebraic, Hebraic is to kind of squelch or to contain uh, all of that uh, human kind of desire and what we're capable of uh, in exchange for a more conservative uh, worship of God, right? So there's the Hellenic and there's the Hebraic. I think when you look at American culture, <laughs> we are a prime example, including a lot of Western European uh, countries of the Hellenic. Uh, we, we glorify the body. We glorify sexuality. Uh, we glorify kind of human achievement. And then when you look at the Middle East, especially certain countries, that's the Hebraic where we have to contain all of these things uh, and make sure that uh, we have a much more conservative sense of things, right? On um, page 104, there's the solemn verse, the, and there's some French here, the Jo, the jo de Vivre, uh, I can't say it, uh, but that translates as exuberant enjoyment of life. And again, that might be the kind of thing from a Hebraic uh, sense of things that we're trying to keep uh, containment over, right? You cannot just have this idea of an exuberant enjoyment of life without consequence, right? Maybe that's the problem for Blanche. On page 105, Mitch is ashamed of his perspiration. He's ashamed of his body. And I think, therefore, he's ashamed of the sins of the flesh and the lust and the desire. One of the, uh, um, one of the questions that I, I have is, is our society obsessed with the body and sexuality and lustful, and lustful notions of our being? And that was what I, uh, I very much look forward to seeing uh, what your uh, responses are there. He talks about how he has an alpaca uh, suit or jacket, an alpaca jacket at home. Alpaca uh, uh, symbolizes the service of love, not lust. Therefore, when he's wearing that, he's not sweating because it's, it's lighter, it's cooler. And if he's not sweating, that means he's not partaking in the sins of the flesh, right? Or desire or, or, or lustfulness. Page 106 and 107. The discussion of Mitch's weight and height is... Uh, an administration of religious value. Uh, and I looked this stuff up. Looked up some of the uh, allusions here. And I'll read from page, uh, I'll read from my book. So this is uh, the height, oh, I'm sorry, the weight is 207 pounds. And I did find it. there's a value of the Hebrew word for light, which um, when you think of 207, it's, uh, it leads to the fountain of life. I'm not sure how useful that one is, but this one's awesome. 
Um, he also gives his height, which is six, six and one half inches, I believe. He's uh, six feet one and one half inches. So I looked up Galatians six one five. And uh, that's Galatians 6, full colon, 1 dash 5. If someone, and, it, and it, this is the kind of the parable behind it. If someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person, and they even use this word, gently. So if somebody is caught in sin, and you're a person of the Spirit, you need to restore that person to the Spirit, but do so gently. However, it does say, but be careful that you are not tempted in the process. So basically what you have here is Mitch trying to bring Blanche back into the light. To try to bring Blanche back into the spirit, right? To maybe even help to redeem her uh, of some of her sinful ways uh, or some of the guilt that she's carrying from her past. Um, he even lifts her physically. He even lifts her in this scene, almost kind of taking her from earth, almost like kind of bringing her to heaven in a, in a way. But she doesn't want, she says, you know, stop that. I want to emphasize the, the use of the word gently here, which is reiterated throughout the text. And Mitch is that gentleness. He is that gentleness. Other characters will get, will, will have that word reference to them as well, but Mitch is that gentleness mostly. Page 114, Blanche reveals the story of her young lover who has a gay affair. And I'll just read uh, something quickly here. This gay affair, no wonder she harbors such insecurities, especially as a woman, because it's in her inadequacy, right, as a woman. If this guy went and had a gay affair, maybe it was, we could argue, maybe one way of thinking about it is, it's because she wasn't an adequate woman for him. The whole notion of her identity is destroyed and, and made to feel unvalued, right? The boy, Alan, possesses an effeminate personality. He comes across, not, not looks, not by looks, he's, he's, he looks just like a, you know, a, a handsome man in that regard, um, but his emotional dispositions and his attitude comes across as a bit more effeminate uh, and soft and gentle. On page 115, Alan, uh, the name actually translates to fair and handsome. It's also a unisex name. Uh, it's meant for both a boy and a girl, which is interesting here. And Alan is the type of man that cannot exist in this world. He is a major contrast to Stanley, who is aggressive and violent, right? In fact, he turns that violence on himself instead of onto another like Stanley does. When Stanley is angry and frustrated, he turns his violence onto Stella. When Alan had a anger or a need to kind of express some anger, he turned it on himself and he took his own life. He cannot exist in this world. The candle light in the very end, the candle light replaces the light of the endless searching, which is, I think the candle light is God's embrace and she's looking for it. And I think she finds it at the end of the scene. It's quite, it's quite amazing. I just want to mention this, last couple ideas. Um, she has a lot of guilt Blanche, she has a lot of guilt as she is this woman who proclaims that she is disgusted by a gay man, and the implications run deep. She made him commit suicide, uh, or at least was a factor in it, because she made him feel like he had done something wrong. Right? I think she says, you've done something that's disgusting, and I think she highly re regrets that, and made him feel like he had to take that next step, which was, you know, taking his own life. Mitch forgives her like a priest. He kisses her, I think it's like on the cheek, here, here, right? He, it's almost priest-like. And again, we are left with the candlelight in her final words. Sometimes there's God so quickly. She got God here. And one of the questions, of course, is what does she mean by this? Well, I think she's kind of, she's gotten that gentleness. She's been able to kind of come clean and be honest with somebody, which maybe is the first time. Uh, and Mitch is not necessarily judging her. He won't forget it, 
he, or he, he'll, he won't forget other things down the road here, but it seems like he's offered the forgiveness that she needs. All right, that's going to cover scenes one through six, um, and then we'll cover uh, seven through 11 uh, next time around here. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great day.